In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, the full title of this talk is uh, actually the ev evidence for a global flood and its importance for our times. And it's interesting to to note that skepticism about a global flood has a long history. There was actually a bishop from Armenia who attended the First Ecumenical Council in Nicaea who learned that there were people in his area who didn't believe in a global flood and in Noah's Ark, and he was so upset about this that according to, tra to tradition, he set out for the mountains of Ararat to get the physical evidence to convince the skeptics that the whole story in the sacred history of Genesis was true. And uh, according to the tradition, he was stopped by an angel, but was given a piece of wood from the ark, and that wood was uh, incorporated or preserved in the mother church of the Armenians and uh, can still be venerated to this day. But the point of the story is that skepticism about the flood has a long history. It's nothing new, but those who have true piety don't accept that. They want to show in every possible way that everything in the sacred history of Genesis is true, including everything that Moses taught us about Noah's flood. And we're going to see that um, we need to have that same passion that St. James of Nisibis had in our time, because Noah's flood has a special significance for us in, in our generation. But St. Peter warned us before the time of St. James of Nisibis that there would come a time when people would come into the church saying that things have always been the same from the beginning of creation and therefore we don't have to believe in this fiat creation of all things in the beginning or in this global cataclysm that totally changed the face of the earth. But St. Peter says that when that time comes, these people are going to have to ignore the fact, not the belief, but the fact that it was the word of God, the fiat, that created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain in the beginning, and that there was a divine judgment upon the whole world that totally destroyed the first created world. So he says the world that then was, the first created world, perished in the flood. So that we can't even look at the earth as it is today and understand what the earth looked like before the flood, much less look at what's going on in nature today and extrapolate from that to explain how everything came to be in the beginning. But as you've already heard, and as our DVD series, Foundations Restored, emphasizes, this revolution against the traditional doctrine of creation was spearheaded by the Enlightenment so-called philosophers, and René Descartes was the first baptized Catholic scoffer to really bring this 
prophecy of St. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 to its fulfillment, when after dabbling in the occult, after leading a very immoral life, after leaving Catholic France for a Protestant country where he was free to think and say and do as he pleased, René Descartes, by his own admission, had three mystical dreams in which he said a spirit of truth possessed him and put him on this path to developing a wonderful new way of thinking that would change the way everybody thought. And one of those wonderful new ideas that he got from the spirit of truth, alias a demon of some kind, was this idea that it's more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature, like plants or stars or animals or even the human body, in terms of the same material processes that are going on now instead of this strange idea that things just popped into existence in the beginning. And of course, Descartes' works were put on the index of forbidden books, but little by little, that false philosophy insinuated itself into the minds of virtually the whole intellectual elite of the Western world, so that today, we're all Cartesians. It's, it's in the air that we breathe. And yet, Blaise Pascal, who was every bit as great a genius as Descartes and a contemporary of his, had the ability to see the terrible consequences of the acceptance of this false uniformitarian naturalistic philosophy of Descartes and Immanuel Kant and Spinoza and the Enlightenment philosophers. And so Pascal warned in Pensée, he said, I cannot forgive Descartes, for in all his philosophy he did his best to dispense with God. Oh, he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. The Big Bang for, that Adamar has been telling us about. But after that, he had no more use for God. This is an amazing insight from one of Descartes' contemporaries, seeing that if we believe that things have always been the same from the beginning, and that th the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in more or less the same way from the very first moment of the universe, then what do we need God for? All we need God for is to start everything in motion, and then we can forget about Him. We don't need any revelation from Him we don't need a church because with our minds and our technology, we can simply study what's going on and from that we can figure it all out for ourselves. And isn't that the mentality of modern science? Now, it was James Hutton and Charles Lyell the ge and the geologists who built on these false philosophical foundations to really get the evolution revolution off the ground in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so their fundamental principle was the present is the key to the past. And this is a logical principle if you accept Descartes' false uniformitarian naturalism. Because if things have always been the same from the beginning, then it's logical that we can study what is going on in the present and from that, we can reason back to the beginning and explain how everything came to be. There's only one problem with this. and As we like to say, it's not only wrong, it's the opposite of the truth. Because in reality, if we want to understand the present, there are three supernatural events in the past that we simply have to understand. Number one, it was a supernatural creation. Number two, there was a supernatural divine judgment upon the entire universe when the original sin occurred. And number three, there was another supernatural divine judgment on the whole earth at the time of Noah's flood. So, in reality, it's the past that is the key to the present, 
And the only way we can know what happened in the past, especially in terms of these three pivotal, pivotal events, is from divine revelation, is from the church. So this is again not only wrong, it's the opposite of the truth. And of course, because Lyell and Hutton and their disciples embraced the false philosophy of Descartes and Immanuel Kant and the Enlightenment philosophers, they thought that they had to be able to explain everything that we see in the rocks of the earth in terms of what they could observe in the present. And so they imagined that the sedimentary rocks, the fossil-bearing rocks all over the earth, formed gradually, that great bodies of water came over the land, sediments settled out, the waters withdrew, and then this process was repeated over and over again over eons of time. And so if that were true, and it isn't, then of course, when they looked at the great sedimentary rock formations all over the earth, like the Grand Canyon, they could be sure that these must have formed, first they thought, over hundreds of thousands, and then millions, and now hundreds of millions of years. And of course, if that were true, then the fossils in the rocks seemed to tell the story of life developing from the simpler to the more complex, from the fish, to the amphibian, to the reptile, to the bird, to the mammal, and finally to man. And that, of course, is how we get Darwin's hypothesis of microbe to man evolution. Darwin admits right in Origin of Species that if you do not accept Lyell's work, you might as well close my book. Because Darwin's speculations in biology are completely based on Lyell and Hutton's wild speculations in geology, which are totally based on Descartes' false philosophy that he got from the spirit of truth, alias Lucifer or another demon. But that's how we get the so-called tree of life, which we should never allow our children or grandchildren to learn by this name except to pass an examination in biology, because we should always refer to this as the tree of death, because it's 550 plus million years of death and destruction which the theistic evolutionists require to get us from the bottom of the tree of death to the top so that we can have human evolution. So we can see just how remarkable is this prophecy from St. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. And we can also see why it's so important that we be able to defend not only the fiat creation of all things in the beginning, but also the divine judgment of Noah's flood. And so I want to very quickly make a short theological case for the historical reality of Noah's flood as a global flood. And then I want to focus on some of the most impressive physical evidence for the historical reality of the global flood and end by pointing out why it is so important for us in our time to believe in the historical reality of the deluge. So when we make the theological case for the global flood, I think there are very, four very strong arguments which are easy to make. The first is that our Lord Jesus Christ himself testified to the global extent of the flood. He compares the global flood to his second coming, or rather the second coming to the global flood. The second coming is an event that will be experienced by every creature on earth when it occurs. And our Lord Jesus Christ compares it to Noah's flood because that was also an event which affected every single creature on earth when it occurred. Secondly, the Council of Trent 
in Vatican I defined that when all the fathers of the Church agree on any interpretation of Scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals, that's the truth. And all of the fathers without exception testified to the historical reality of the flood and to its global extent. Now, someone might say, well, that, but that isn't a matter of faith or morals, but it is, because all of the fathers also saw the ark as a type of the church. And just as no one could be saved from the deluge without being on board the ark, so they said nobody can be saved for eternal life without entering the ark of the Holy Catholic Church. So the reality of the ark and of the global extent of the flood is directly involved in the Father's understanding of salvation and the Church. A third reason, a very compelling reason, to accept the global extent of the flood is that in both the Hebrew Scriptures and in the Septuagint and in the New Testament, there is a unique word that is used for the flood, for Noah's flood. There are other words that describe a local flood, which were available to Moses and to the Septuagint translators. But any time in Hebrew or Greek that the flood is mentioned, it is always mentioned with a unique term that only applies to Noah's flood. And in the Greek New Testament and in the Septuagint, the word is cataclysmos, which is where we get our word cataclysm in English. And this is only used to refer to Noah's flood because it was a unique event. When our Lord Jesus Christ tells the parable about the man who built his house on sand and the flood came and washed the house away, he doesn't use cataclysmos. He uses another Greek word for a typical flood, local flood. So the fact that this word is only used to describe Noah's flood is very significant. Then another reason why we can be sure that the flood was global in extent is that we know that Noah spent many, many decades constructing the ark according to the exact specifications that were given to him by God. Now, why would he go to all of this trouble to create an ark that could house representatives of each kind of land animal when if the ark, if the flood was simply going to be a local event, the animals could just have moved over to the next valley or to some other area of land that wouldn't be inundated. It doesn't make any sense at all. If God used his almighty power to bring representatives of every kind to the ark, surely he was capable of inspiring or directing the animals to move to the next valley or a few valleys over to escape the local flood that modern Bible scholars say is all that occurred when the deluge took place. No, it doesn't make any sense, and that leads directly to what I think is really the most compelling reason to reject this idea that the flood was a local flood, because it makes God a liar. God promises Noah that he will never bring a judgment upon the world ever again as he did in the flood. But if the flood was a local flood, then God has broken his word thousands and thousands of times because we've had all kinds of massive floods which have brought tremendous destruction and loss of life. They've occurred all over the world. They're still occurring today. If Noah's flood was a local flood, then God simply lied to Noah and lied to us, and that is impossible. But what about the physical evidence for a global flood? Because most of the skeptics today don't even think they need to deal with the theological arguments, because from their perspective, the 
the physical impossibility of the global flood is in their minds so obvious that it's a waste of time to even discuss the theological arguments. And yet the reality is there's overwhelming physical evidence for the reality of the global flood. And it's all around us and it makes everything make sense, especially when you drive in an area like this and you see the road cuts in the big highways that many of us had to take to, to get to this wonderful place. So we're going to go through six very compelling bodies of evidence for the reality of the global flood. First, we have eyewitness testimony from all over the world. Now, that's not physical evidence, so I shouldn't have put it into that category, but it's very powerful evidence, as we'll see. Then, to take the physical evidence, we have marine fossils on top of the Earth's highest mountains all over the world. Then we have, number three, billions and billions of very well-preserved fossils of all kinds of marine and land creatures mixed together all over the Earth. Number four, we see sediment layers that cover vast areas, even entire continents, which then can be picked up and followed on other continents that are separated by oceans. Number five, when we look at these layers, we see there is usually very little evidence of any kind of slow or gradual erosion. Everything speaks of very rapid deposition of one layer, massive layer of sediment on top of another. And this is reflected, as we'll see, in the mountain ranges where we can see layer after layer of sedimentary rock folded at very tight angles without any evidence of any kind of shattering or deformation telling us that these layers were laid down while they were still moist and malleable and uplifted before they could dry. And finally, wherever you go in the world, you will see oversized valleys and water gaps, which are very, very difficult to explain in a uniformitarian context, but which are very easy to explain in terms of, the Noah, of Noah's flood. So let's just take a closer look quickly at each of these points. If you look at the testimony of explorers and anthropologists and missionaries who've gone all over the world, one thing that they all agree upon is that everywhere in the world, people have handed on from generation to generation a memory of a global flood. And when uh, scholars have collected the various accounts that indigenous people have preserved of, the no of Noah's flood, what they've found is that these accounts agree not only on the fundamental point that the flood was a judgment by God on the human race, that there was only one family that was saved, that they were saved in a boat and they took animals on the boat, you can find that there are even many details that have been preserved in these traditional histories which agree with the Mosaic account of the flood, such things as the, the family releasing a bird to determine whether the flood waters had subsided and the land had begun to appear. And this is very difficult to explain reasonably, except that there was a global flood which was experienced by the ancestors of every people group on earth. That's the most logical, straightforward explanation for this evidence. If you are going to reject that, then you end up having to come up with all kinds of very strange explanations like Carl Jung, that we have this 
unconscious archetype of a flood or something like that, which are pure speculation, and there's simply no reason to resort to those kinds of explanations when the straightforward logical explanation fits the facts perfectly well. So let's move on to the physical evidence. Everywhere we go where we find high mountain ranges, be it the Himalayas or the Andes or the Rockies, we always will find marine fossils, the fossils of marine creatures on the tops of these high mountains. Now, this has been known for a long time. Voltaire suggested that this is because pilgrims went on pilgrimage and uh, because the shell was associated with the pilgrimage uh, to St. James of Compostela, he suggested maybe pilgrims dropped shells on the tops of the mountains, and that's why we find them there. But, of course, we know that doesn't hold water because we don't just find them in the mountain ranges where Christian pilgrims would have gone. We find them all over the earth. So, this tells us that the, those sediments which are now at the top of the world's highest mountains, were once submerged, and marine creatures were submerged along with them. Now, we also find very remarkable, massive deposition of marine creatures, which are now in the middle of the land of massive continents, like this red wall limestone in the Grand Canyon, and uh, this is uh, typical of, of formations that we find all over the Earth where there are literally billions of nautiloids, these chambered marine creatures, and they're, they're spread out over uh, an, an enormous area, and there's simply nothing that, we can ex that we've experienced in historical times that could explain this type of deposition of such a huge number of marine creatures over such an enormous area. And uh, this is just one example of what we find all over the world. The other thing that is important to note is that fossilization itself is an extraordinary process. All around here, even in a place like Vandalia, animals are dying all the time. Raccoons are dying, birds are dying, lizards are dying, insects are dying, raccoons are dying. How many of them are being fossilized? None. Nothing is being fossilized, and yet creatures are dying all around us every day. The mere fact that the earth contains literally billions and billions and billions of the very well-preserved remains of all kinds of plants and animals, marine creatures and land creatures mixed together in most cases, tells us that something very extraordinary happened in the past, because this, does, this has not happened in historical times, that this type of fossilization occurs. It's very, very unusual occurrence, because in order for fossilization to occur, you have to bury a creature very rapidly and preserve it, protect it from the scavengers, which will otherwise come and break down the dead raccoons and deer and everything else so that there's literally nothing left of them at the end but some chemicals. And here you have an ichthyosaur giving birth in the very moment when the mother was fossilized, giving birth to the baby. And of course, dinosaur graveyards are some of the most spectacular fossil graveyards on the earth, and most of them show dinosaur remains disarticulated, jumbled together, and mixed together with marine creatures. So we're talking about in some cases, very large land-dwelling dinosaurs broken up into, into pieces and then mixed together with marine creatures in the middle of what is now North America or some huge landmass. There's simply nothing 
that we experience today or in historical times that can explain this type of deposition. But it fits perfectly with the global flood. That would unleash exactly the kind of forces that would produce these phenomena. And it's interesting here in North America, when you look at where the dinosaur graveyards are found, most of them show how dinosaurs were capable of greater mobility than many other creatures, and you can see how they retreated to the higher ground until finally there was nowhere else to go, and they were buried. And this explains why you will sometimes find dinosaur tracks in layers of rock where there's no <laughs> bones of dinosaurs, and then you go up, and in a layer that was supposed to have been laid down millions of years later, you find the actual disarticulated, usually, remains of the dinosaurs whose tracks could be found deeper in the sedimentary rocks. Now, there are some uh, geologists among our separated brethren, especially a uh, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Timothy Clary, who works for the Institute for Creation Research, who've done some amazing research for which we should be very grateful, using data that's been accumulated by geologists, especially um, petroleum geologists, geologists who are looking for valuable natural resources, minerals, whose data are now available to scholars. And what Dr. Clary and others have done is to take all this data and put it together to show that there are actually what they call six mega sequences. These are enormous masses of, of sediment which can be identified as on each continent and you can find them, say, from North America and pick them up in Africa and see that they actually are global in extent. So this is uh, one of these mega sequences. And here Dr. Clary shows how this SOC mega sequence, which he identifies as the first stage of the flood, these were the first, the first wave of, of flood sediments to be deposited by the flood waters, can literally be traced from North America to North Africa. It's the same exact type of sediment, and yet these continents are obviously separated by an ocean. Uh, here he shows how you can look at the African continent and you can find all six of these mega sequences, one on top of the other, on the African continent, and, th and they've done this on other continents as well. In addition to this, we know that there are, uh, within these mega sequences, certain kinds of uh, depositions that are absolutely different, uh, or radically different from what we observe happening in nature today. Many of us have seen pictures of the White Cliffs of Dover, and these are chalk beds that extend from southern England all the way across Europe to the Middle East. The same layers, the same type of sediment. And, and just ask yourself, what kind of event that we experience in our time or in historical times could ever produce something like this? It, there's no analog. This was obviously a type of uh, sedimentary deposition that was the result of a unique event that simply hasn't been repeated since. Here in this part of the country, I'm sure you all observe the coal seams that we see in the road cuts as we're driving on the big highways through the Midwest. But these same coal seams can literally be followed all the way from here to the East Coast and picked up in Europe and followed all the way to the Donetsk Basin north of the Caspian Sea. Think about that. What kind of local flood could produce these kinds of uh, geological 
formations. There simply is nothing in, re in our time or in historical times that has produced anything remotely like this. And here we get to the point about the lack of erosion between these massive layers of sediment. Because all over the world, and you can see this very clearly, for example, in the Grand Canyon, you have layer upon massive layer of sediment, and there's almost no evidence of erosion between the layers. Now, if the evolutionary story were true, and these sediments had been laid down over hundreds of millions of years, there would have been time for wind and water and creatures to do all kinds of work which would have deformed those layers. We see no evidence of that whatsoever. Everything speaks of massive bodies of water depositing massive amounts of sediment, layer upon layer upon layer without any significant time between the deposition of the different layers. And of course, another piece of evidence that harmonizes with this interpretation is the polystrate fossils that we find all over the earth, things like this tree in Nova Scotia, which is buried in a vertical position and stands in multiple layers of sediment, which, according to the standard geochronology, would have been laid down over tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Now, it's simply physically impossible for a tree to stand while it's being buried by sediment without simply disintegrating for more than decades. It's certainly not going to survive for thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of years. And yet, all over the Earth, we find these polystrate fossils. And they're not just trees. There have been found, for example, whales that were buried in a vertical position, and layers and layers have built up around them. And I don't think anybody imagines that a whale just stood on his tail for hundreds of thousands of years while sediment gradually built up around him after he died or while he was somehow preserved from disintegrating. It's silly, but when you accept the reality of Noah's flood, these kinds of phenomena make perfect sense. And of course, one of the reasons why Lyellian geology doesn't make sense is because Lyell and Hutton and their disciples had no facilities for doing real empirical research in their field. There were no laboratories for studying how moving water deposits sediment. They simply took walks in the English countryside or the Scottish countryside and speculated about how sedimentary rocks might have been formed, assuming that Descartes' false philosophy that the present is the key the to the past was true. Today, and for quite some time now, we have laboratories the size of college gymnasia where scientists do real empirical research in the field of sedimentology. And this is a picture of the lab at Colorado State University where a French researcher named Guy Berteau, uh, who has been in the forefront of this new sedimentological research, he and others have been able to do experiments with flumes that cover very large areas, that, like I said, the size of a, of a professional sports stadium, where they can control the variables, the type of sediment, the water, the flow, all of these variables they can control. And what these sedimentologists have discovered is that Lyle and Hutton left out of account one of the most important factors in sedimentary deposition, which is moving currents of water. Because in the real world, sediments do not normally just settle out of still water. 
In the real world, what's usually happening is water is moving and sediment is being, is settling out of moving currents of water. And that makes an enormous difference in how you interpret what's left after sedimentary deposition has occurred. And so in the real world, when sediments are being deposited, this is what is usually happening. And what Guy Berto and other researchers like Alexander Lalamov, from sedimentologist from the Russian Federation, or Jurgen Schieber next door at Indiana State University, what they can point out is that in this real world deposition, you'll notice that the sediment over at the far corner of the slide is being deposited at exactly the same time as the sediment at the upper corner closest to me. And yet, if Charles Lyell takes a walk in the English countryside and looks at this long after it's been laid down, he's going to imagine that this particle at the far end of the slide was laid down maybe hundreds or thousands of years before the particle up here, not realizing that they were laid down at exactly the same time. And so what sedimentologists have begun to do is to use the empirical research that has been done in the field of sedimentology to reinterpret the rock record. And uh, Guy Berto and Steve Austin, one of our separated brethren, uh, did uh, an analysis of the Tonto group, which is a very large section of the, or a substantial section anyway, of the Grand Canyon. And Guy Berto's paper on this was published by the main geological journal, peer-reviewed geological journal in France back in 1993. And he shows that when you actually analyze the makeup of the sediments in the Grand Canyon, and especially in this Tonto group section of the Grand Canyon, what they tell us in light of cutting-edge sedimentology is that these sediments were laid down by a massive amount of water moving from east to west across what is now the southwestern United States, and they were deposited laterally and vertically at the same time in a matter of weeks, not hundreds of millions, not, not uh, the Tonto group, I think they say, took 13 million years or something like that to form. But when you look at the way at the sediments that make up the Tonto group in light of real empirical research in the field, the most logical explanation is that this entire section of the Grand Canyon was laid down in a matter of days or weeks, not millions of years. And of course, um, another way that we can look at the Earth as it is today and see it almost screaming out that a global flood occurred is because when the flood waters finally ran off the continental land masses, one of the things that they did was to shear off surfaces. And this is different from normal erosion because the forces that were unleashed when these floodwaters ran off the continents were so mighty that they didn't differentiate by rocks of different hardness. In some cases, they just planed everything off. And this is why in Africa, for example, where we've spent much of our time because we find the greatest receptivity from the church hierarchy in Africa, 60%, almost two-thirds of the entire African continent is a planation surface where hard rock, soft rock, everything just got sheared off at as a plane. And this is something that requires enormous amounts of, of energy to be able to accomplish that kind of planing, and yet we see it over almost two-thirds of the African continent, and we see it 
in other parts of the world as well. And there's nothing that we've experienced in recent times or in historical times that could explain that. Now, um, the I said earlier that the flood really helps to make sense of what we see, and one of the ways that it does that we can we've all experienced whether we've been conscious of it or not is in the the river valleys as we can observe them all over the earth wherever you go whether you can go to australia and see it you can go to asia europe it doesn't matter you're going to see this phenomenon and uh, there are two things in particular that i'd like to note one is have you ever thought about the fact that whenever wherever you go in the world where there is a river valley you'll almost always see this great big valley with this tiny little river <laughs> running through the middle of it my family lives in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Well, there are two forks of the Shenandoah Valley, but of the Shenandoah River, but they're just tiny little ribbons of water, and yet there are these huge valleys surrounding them. And I never really thought about this very much until I got into this apostolate and realized that this really doesn't make any sense in terms of uniformitarian geology, but it makes perfect sense in light of the flood. Because when you had the runoff from the flood, those flood waters carved out enormous valleys. And once, but once the flood waters had run off into the ocean basins, what you were left with was a very, very small amount of water. And that's exactly what you see. You see, uh, in most cases, in any significant river system, a very big valley with a small ribbon of water running through it. But that's not all. If you're uh, observing what you see as you drive through this part of the country, or you drive, and you, especially if you drive from one valley into another, is that in many places there are cuts in the side of the valley where nothing is happening. And you, I don't know if you ever asked yourself the question, why is a notch carved in this valley where there's no water and nothing, nothing is happening? And uniformitarian geologists try to come up with explanations, but the explanations they come up with are not something that we see in the real world. But we don't have any trouble explaining these things because when the flood waters were running off the surface of the continents, it was just like when we played with water at the beach and you and you're you're pouring your water and you see how it will find the quickest way to get to the lowest place and it will cut different channels, but then eventually it will find one path that is the quickest and all the water will start to pour through that channel. Well, that's exactly what happened. As the waters were running off the continents, at first, the water would find various pathways to get to the ocean basins and would cut these notches. But once the water started to canalize into these smaller number of, of better passageways where it could more quickly find its way to the ocean, it would leave these other ones high and dry. And when the floodwaters had receded, you had these notches cut in valleys all over the world with no real logical explanation in terms of anything that anybody would ever experience in the here and now from the time of the flood until today. And yet, if you accept the historical reality of Noah's flood, every time you see one of those things, it, it can make perfect sense to you. And so, coming to the end of our physical evidence for the flood, we also want to take special note of the fact that all over the earth, especially where in our mountain ranges, we see that mountains were uplifted, and if you take a cross-section of your mountain range, you find layer upon layer upon layer of different kinds of sediment, which is uplifted sometimes at very sharp angles, 
and there's no deformation. There's no shattering of the rocks whatsoever. And this tells us that these sediments were not laid down over millions and hundreds of millions of years because had that been the case, they would have desiccated and when the uplift occurred, there would have been shattering, there would have been fracturing, there would have been deformation. You wouldn't see these beautiful folds where layer upon layer upon layer are all folded together neatly without any shattering or deformation. This testifies to the fact that the mountain building occurred after the sediments had been laid down entirely or almost entirely at the, at the end of Noah's flood. And so we see there's eyewitness testimony from all over the world, marine fossils on top of the Earth's highest mountains, billions of fossils of marine and land creatures buried together, uh, sediment layers covering vast layers extending from one continent to another, no evidence of slow and gradual erosion between the layers, just rapid deposition, oversized valleys and water gaps all over the world. Now, I want to just speak very briefly about the flood mechanism because Moses, God through Moses, tells us that the flood happened and gives us quite a bit of information. But he did not see fit to give us a detailed explanation of the mechanism. So it's legitimate, as Robertson Jenis said yesterday, to take the facts which God has given us in Genesis and try to fill in the gaps using our reason. But there are competing hypotheses today with regard to the mechanism of the flood. And I'm not going to try to get into the details. I'll simply say that, to my knowledge, the two main competitors that have support within the scientific community of natural scientists, especially geologists, who take God at his word in the sacred history of Genesis, are what's called catastrophic plate tectonics, or CPT, and the hydroplate, hydroplate theory of Dr. Walt Brown, who has a, a PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT and taught at the Air Force Academy, and to whom Adamar made reference in his presentation. Um, at the moment, uh, our scientists are favoring catastrophic plate tectonics, and I'm going to to speak very briefly about it now, but I want to share something with you that I think might be helpful because at first I was very disturbed that there should be such violent disagreement between people who take God at his word with regard to the flood mechanism. But then I realized something. <laughs> I realized that the question is never going to be solved in terms of natural science. Why? Because you cannot deny that the flood was supernatural. It doesn't mean that we can't know certain things about the flood by using the knowledge that we have gained in different areas of natural science. But what has become crystal clear to me from reading these debates is that both of the hypotheses have problems and ultimately I don't think the problems can be solved if you leave God out of the equation. In other words, at the end of the day, the only thing that's ever going to make sense and as Father Sean said, at that final judgment, when we find out what really happened from the beginning of the world until the end, and we see, you know, exactly how the flood took place, we're going to see that, yes, the natural scientists could explain many things, but that it's God ultimately who made it happen, and where the natural science explanation falls short, even in the best hypothesis that can be formulated given the current state of the evidence, it's only God and his supernatural power and agency 
that will be able to close the gap between the hypothesis and the evidence. But in the CPT model, we have uh, its probably foremost exponent in um, John Baumgartner, who's one of the leading scientists in computer modeling of geological phenomena in the entire world and is recognized as such by evolution-believing geologists and experts in his field. We have the Pangaea, the one land mass that was created in the beginning on the third day of creation when God made the dry land appear and gathered the waters into one place. And then there was a uh, kind of a separate, there was a, a catastrophic movement of plates on which the land masses rest so that they were moving apart at meters per second and all kinds of unique geological activity was taking place very, very rapidly so that the continents ended up in the positions where we see them today. And there is, there is a lot of good evidence for CPT. Uh, I don't have time to get into it now. I encourage you to study the arguments for the hydroplate theory on Dr. Walt Brown's website in the beginning. It's all available for free. And to go to uh, Answers in Genesis or Creation Ministries International or ICR and look at the arguments for CPT um, and see what you think. But in our DVD series, part of which we're going to show tonight, on especially the section on radiometric dating, we cite some of the evidence for the catastrophic plate tectonics hypothesis as a good explanation for how the flood might have occurred. But what I really want to emphasize, which is an aspect of what the CPT hypothesis predicts, which is important, is that there was a tremendous amount of volcanic activity that took place in conjunction with Noah's flood. And especially in the, in the CPT model, the specific kind of volcanic activity that occurred produced the aerosols, shot the material up into the atmosphere that is the only really logical explanation for the, the ice age. We were all taught in school that there were multiple ice ages, but the evidence actually supports the idea that there was only one ice age, which of course had its certain fluctuations over a 500 to 700 year period. But the reality is, which is kind of ironic in our time of climate alarmism, that you cannot explain an ice age without a global flood. And it's really very simple. When, when water, when air is cooled, it holds less moisture. When air is warmer, it holds more moisture. So if you have a gradual cooling or a gradual warming, well, in this case, gradual cooling, you're never going to be able to get the kind of massive effects that we see in the ice age because the cooler the air gets, the less moisture it's going to, to be able to hold. What you need to produce an ice age that affects a very substantial portion of the Earth's surface is a global flood because the global flood with the volcanic activity had the exactly right combination of elements. You had all this moisture being evaporated up into the atmosphere, but then the aerosols from the volcanic activity blocked out much of the light of the sun, which made the temperature plummet, which resulted in massive precipitation of snow and ice, which would produce your ice age. And of course, there would be some seasonal fluctuations, but it makes perfect sense that that ice age continued for five to 700 years after Noah's flood. And there's a lot of archeological 
evidence that supports that uh, understanding. And so your global flood leads logically to the Ice Age, and it all, everything fits together very well. And uh, it's also important to recognize you can find in the DVD series in the section on the flood, we show that when engineers who specialize in uh, engineering of, of ships look at the specifications for the Ark, they say, this craft was ideally designed from an engineering point of view to ride out the worst <laughs> seas that anybody ever had to experience. They say it was, it was made to withstand waves that reached 100 feet in height. So the, the Ark, as described by Moses in Genesis, it was perfectly designed to do what it did, not to get from one place to another, as is the case with most boats, but simply to ride out the worst storm at sea that ever was. Um, and when you look at the genetics data, it all fits perfectly with the reality that everybody on Earth is, today is descended from one family and from, from one group of men who had a very similar Y chromosome, but three different women who had slightly different mitochondrial DNA lineages. It fits perfectly with what geneticists have found by studying people groups all over the world. So I, want to, I do want to just finish with why this is so important for our time. The global flood reminds us of things which modernism is trying to make us deny or forget. First, the flood testifies to God's sovereignty over this world. He is the Lord of this world. Theistic evolution makes him very distant. The flood reminds us he is our loving and just Father. He is very present to us. He judged the world before, he will judge it again. Secondly, it testifies to our dominion over the world. There's a kind of pantheism that's infusing so many even church documents that are not authoritative, but nevertheless, they carry a certain amount of weight coming from important church offices and individuals. And yet the flood reminds us, God created everything for us. We are the ones who have dominion over all of the other creatures because all the animals and plants in the whole wide world had to suffer because of our sin. That shows that we have that dominion from God. And the ark is a type of the church, but also of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And this is very important, not only because we need to remember that there's no salvation outside of the church, but also because in our time, Our Lady told us at Fatima, only I can help you. She is the ark of these times. So we need to be consecrated to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, every bit as much as everyone needed to get on board the ark before Noah's flood. And finally, the, the history of the global flood is a warning to our generation, and we'd better take it seriously. There have been saints whose private revelations were approved by the church, like Blessed Alina Aiello, who were told very explicitly that these, the, that our times are worse than the time before the flood. And, and how bad is that? Moses tells us, before the flood, God saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times. That's pretty bad. And it tells us, I think, that there must be some false way of thinking that has entered into the very air that we breathe so that even good people, even people who are trying to do what is right, are being carried away from God and away from the truth. And I think we could all agree that evolution fits the bill as something that is having this type of effect. But the consequences are serious because in the message of Our Lady of Akita, which was approved by the local bishop after he had submitted it to 
the future Pope Benedict XVI for his approval on the anniversary of the miracle of the sun in the year of Roe versus Wade, Wade, which legalized abortion on demand in this country, she told us that if we don't repent, the Heavenly Father will send a punishment worse than the flood. Fire will fall from heaven, killing most of the people on the earth. And this is why the message of Fatima is so urgent, because the miracle of the sun was, among other things, a warning of the fire from heaven, which is going to come if we do not repent and turn back to God. But we also have the promise that in the end, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will triumph, that the Holy Father will consecrate Russia to her, which he has not done, and that Russia will be converted and a period of peace will be granted to the world. And so we need to believe in the flood, we need to see it as a warning to our generation and try to communicate that to our brothers and sisters, but most of all, we must consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and try to live every moment, every thought, every word, every action, live that consecration, because that's what will bring down the grace for the Pope and the bishops to make the consecration of Russia, which will cause the explosion of grace, it will bring about the conversion of Russia and usher in the era of peace. So there is great certain hope in the midst of the darkness, and let us rejoice in the hope, but also do everything that we can to share it with everybody that we meet. Our Lady of Fatima, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.